would love to tell you what I think of Jesus since I found in him a friend so strong and true. I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. All my life was filled of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his strong and loving arms around me. And he led me in the way I ought to go. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else can take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. Every day he comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand his words of love. But I'll never know just why he came to save me. Till someday I see his blessed face above. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. I was with me tonight to Luke chapter number 6. Luke chapter number 6. We're going to read a couple verses. And uh, we're going to read three verses. And then this is going to be our sort of our jumping off place. I'm going to preach a little bit, a little bit differently than what I normally do. I normally try to preach uh, an expository message. normally try to stay... Pretty close to the text, and we'll use your Bible tonight. We're going to uh, look at a thought, want to build a thought, and uh, hope that it'll be a help to you, hope it'll be an encouragement to you. So once you find your place in Luke chapter number 6, I'd like to invite you to stand. <clears throat> we're going to be looking down in verse number 43, down toward the end of the chapter, and we're going to read these three verses, and then we'll make our prayer, and we can be seated. Thank you so again so very much for being at church tonight. I know you've worked today. I know many of you have rushed to get here. Some of you might have missed supper. And, uh, but I appreciate so much you being at church tonight. It shows, speaks well of your dedication. And I know you're not here for me, you're here for the Lord, but I appreciate so much you being here. And uh, verse number 43, the Bible says this, For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit. That's pretty good preaching right there. Amen. For a good, good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by its fruit. That says every tree. For every tree is known by its fruit. Now, I'm not preaching on this, the world's philosophy of don't judge me, uh, but you're really judging yourself by the fruit you put forth. I'm not casting judgment. I'm just making an observation. You're judging yourself by what fruit comes out. But he said this, For every tree is known by its fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. The Bible says a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. For of the abundance of his heart, his mouth speaketh. Amen. Thank you tonight for standing. You can be seated. You know, people, 
Uh, there's nothing like people, is there? People act all sorts of different ways. If you're around people, you're going to be around all kinds. Uh, if you work with people, you're going to work with all kinds of people. If you work a public job, uh, there's no telling what you're going to encounter. Uh, some people are just happy and joyful people. You ever met those happy, bubbly, joyful people? Yeah, I don't like them either. I mean, just happy, bubbly all the time. Everything's wonderful and roses are blooming and birds are singing and sky's always blue. And, and I mean, they're just happy, happy people. Uh, some people, every time you meet them, they're, they're fearful and they're anxious. I mean, scared of their own shadow. Everything, oh, well, what if? I mean, if it, if it could go wrong, preacher, it's going to go wrong to me. I mean, just anxious about everything, scared to death about it. I mean, they're just anxious, fearful people. Uh, some people are angry all the time. I'm working on it, but some people are angry all the time. I mean, they're mad about something, and if they don't have something to be mad about, they're mad that they don't have anything to be mad about. I mean, they're angry, they're mad, they're upset, they're always up in the air and sorts about something all the time. Some people are just sad all the time. I mean, they're like Eeyore. I mean, everywhere they go, they're just sad all the time. And, you know, you like under heaven, it's not that bad. And so if you can take the sad people and put them around the happy people, if you can take the mad people and put them around the glad people, if you take the, the worrying people and put them around the confident people, you might have pretty good people. But the problem is we're just people. We're just people. Well, everybody's different. But the Bible here teaches us a principle that says of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaking. In other words, what's in my heart is what's going to come out in my demeanor. You know, if I'm, if I'm filled with fear or anxiety, you know what's going to come out? Fear and anxiety. If I'm full of anger, I'm going to blow my top and it's going to eventually come out. If I'm full of joy, that's what's going to come out. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Now, we're not talking about the heart that, that beats and pumps blood all through your body. We're talking about the heart being the seat of our emotion. That which all of us possess, it is the very center, if you would, what lies in the most inner part of our actions and of our reactions. We really do live in a reactionary world. If you think about our world, we live in a world that's filled with not just actions, but it's filled with reaction. Have you ever watched somebody, and we would call it instigation. Now, you don't always have to instigate people to get a reaction out of them, but it just seems like that, that this world can be so antagonistic. to pe It's always antagonizing. It's always trying to pick at people and nip at people and draw people and push people and prod people. And before long, if you push somebody long enough, they're going to push back. Now, I know y'all are calm, peace, meek people, mild Loving everybody and you wouldn't harm a fly. But I can promise you this. If somebody pushes you long enough, you're going to push back. I don't care how much joy you have, you're going to push back. If somebody prods you long enough, you're going to prod back. Now the reason I say that is because we live in a world that is pushing and pushing and pushing. We live in a society that is uh, manipulating, manipulating and manipulating. Well, that's where we live. That's, that's the world in which we live. Now, tonight's not the first time that I preach concerning the heart, nor is it the first time I preach dealing with this passage. Because I believe it's very evident that what's in your heart is going to come out your mouth. <laughs> You've heard people say this, I, man, that just slipped out. The reason something slips out is because it slipped in. Now, listen, we're all human. Don't, we don't live in a bubble, okay? Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Can something slip out? Oh, yeah, but it slips out because something slipped in. Now, don't misunderstand. What I'm so I preached on this before. And by the way, it happens to the best of us, doesn't it? Anybody know what your foot tastes like? Some of you ask for salt and pepper. I mean, yeah, we know. I mean, we've been there. We've been there. But let me tell you, the, the seat of our emotion is where our response comes from. The heart, our response comes from the heart. Eventually, if something's in there, it's going to come out here. It's going to come out here. Now, there's a few things tonight that I want us to see. Christianity, and I, I believe this, and I believe that it's, it's an area in which we ought to work on, but Christianity ought to be so real. By the way, we do need real Christianity in our day. Listen, we need to move past just talking about it. We need to move past just trying to put the badge on. 
We need, to put, we need to move past being a card-carrying member and understand that Christianity ought to be so big, it ought to be so real, it ought to be so vital that it's going to come out somewhere. It ought to come out in our thinking. It ought to come out in our speaking. It ought to come out in our acting. It ought to come out if it's in. We need, the Lord help us, we need real, genuine Christianity to permeate our country, our society, hey, our churches. We need real Christians in our church. Just because people come to church don't mean that they have real Christianity. And we need real Christianity, and Christianity will affect us because if it's in our heart, it's going to come out in our actions. Jeremiah 17, 9, the Bible teaches us some things about the heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I talked to a preacher, and he gave me a little bit of enlightenment on this. Now, I do believe this whole ordeal about, oh, you just follow your heart can lead you to the wrong place. It can lead you to the wrong place. But there is a flip side of that equation for the born-again child of God. Now, I want you to think about it for just a minute. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can, who can know it? Do you realize that we were born with a wicked heart? You and I were born with heart problems. We was born with a wicked, filthy, dirty, rotten, unpurified heart. The seat of our very emotions are wicked. But the Bible tells me something very interesting about the heart. Because the Bible tells me that in Romans chapter number 10, verse number 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine, help me, wow. That filthy, rotten, vile, perverted heart. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto right. You, you say, preacher, where are you going? I like it. Listen, God can take that dirty, filthy, rotten heart and change that heart and give you a brand spanking new, purified, clean heart that we can follow that heart, not the old fleshly heart, but the new heart. And that, that heart now can be that which we draw out the seed of our emotions from. How do you have Bible for that? Ezekiel chapter 36, verse number 26. The Bible says this. God's talking to Israel and he says this. A new heart also I, will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. You say, what is he talking about? I know he's talking about Israel. But it's the same concept. God said, I'll take away that old hard, rough heart. That old callous. That old, that old vile heart that's turned against God and forsaken God. He said, I'm going to take that away. And I'm going to give you a brand new, soft, fleshy pliable, moldable heart. And I'm going to give you that heart that can cry out to God one more time. He said, I'll give you a new heart. A New Testament principle to that would be found in Romans chapter number 2. He said, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision, that is of the heart. That's a remade, that's a cutting away of the old and a giving of the new. The circumcision is of the heart and the spirit, not in letter whose praise is not a member of God. The Lord in salvation. I'll get to my message in just a minute. The Lord in salvation hath taken that sinner and that old wicked ungodly sinner and have taken that wicked ungodly heart and upon his profession of faith and his faith that he's placed with that heart in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ he has given him a transformed or a brand new heart and that heart now rests and dwells and abides with him and so therefore we have a new source to pull from if you would and a child of God should respond out of not the old heart, but out of the new heart. All right, now, let's look at some things tonight. What then, those of us who have been saved, and I'm preaching to saved people tonight. Now, if you're here this evening, and you've never had a new heart, may I say first and foremost, that's the, most, that's the greatest need you'll ever have, is to have a change of heart. Yes, the greatest need you'll ever have is to get rid of that old perverted, filthy, wicked, vile heart and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and allow Him to give you a brand new heart, allow Him to give you a brand new start and be saved by the grace of God. But for those of us on this Wednesday evening who are saved, and I don't take that for granted, 
for those of us on Wednesday night who are saved and we are born again by the grace of God, we've experienced that change of heart. How we live and respond and how we act from salvation forward really is a matter of the heart. It really is a matter as to which heart that I am following after. As to which heart I am drawing from. And so if we understand, it's almost like if you had two wells. Now I don't know if anybody's ever had a well that's maybe gone bad. I know when it, sometimes before when it would rain, mom and dad would get, their, their, their well would get muddy. I guess that's the best thing to get. Uh, just red clay looking mud and I think the pump we, dad eventually figured out the pump was setting too low or whatever and got that raised up but when it would rain like that they'd come sometimes come to the house and they would get water because my well's deeper and so they could get water now if I had to drink from two wells let me tell you I'm not going to drink from the one that's got the red water if it looks like the Yadkin I probably don't want to drink it you see, but that's the real concept with all, in our life as a believer. We can choose which well we're going to pull from. I, can, I have a choice as to which well I'm going to draw from. I can either draw out of that well that's shallow. I can either draw out of that well that's muddy and that's dirty and that's smart. Or I can draw from that new well that's springing up like, a, like rivers of living water. And I can live under that well. And so it's a choice that we're going to have to make. But it's a matter of the heart. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Okay, now let's look at some things. What about us? When we allow the seed of our emotions to be arrived from the old man or new, what, one key factor, a simple characteristic, it's your heart. You know the thing about the heart is, I can't control your heart and you can't control mine. Anybody ever heard this statement, well, I don't know their heart? Let me tell you what they mean. I mean, I don't have a lot of confidence in them. That's what it means. Well, preacher, I, that's kind of like bless your heart. That's a nice way of saying, I don't trust him. I don't know if what he says with his lips is really what he has. I don't know his heart. But in reality, I don't know their heart. I don't know their heart. I don't know a person. But you said, I, I don't know their heart. But the reality is, it's not for me to know your heart. You, 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 by the way, you do know their heart because that's what's coming out of their mouth. You can figure out what's in their heart by what comes out of their mouth. You know, you've been on the workplace, right, when people all of a sudden get religion when they find out you're a Christian? Y'all been on there before? Oh, you, oh yeah, I've been, I've been in church my whole life. My papa was a deacon. He was a good man. He, boy, I mean, mama, she raised us in church. Yeah, well, it should have went from the pew to your mouth. That's where it should have went from. So you really do know their heart, but it's your heart. You're responsible for what comes out of your mouth, what comes out of your life, and what comes out of your heart. All right, so what happens as we look at your heart as some matters of these hearts? Now, the first thing, we're going, to, we're going to look at three things quickly tonight, and I'm going to let you go to the house. First of all, let's look at the repair of the heart that's sometimes necessary. People that have heart problems, they'll go in the hospital, they maybe a, a valve replacement or whatever. You know, they, there's something not right with the heart. Some, maybe they were born that way, maybe there was a problem, maybe they've had a heart attack and had to have a stent or whatever. May, uh, but there's something that, that went wrong in their heart. Now, it doesn't mean that you've got to throw it away, but there's something you need fixed. You know, if we're not careful in our Christian walk, we can allow things to creep in and something, we can allow some things to go wrong in our heart. And when that takes place, we're not just to say, oh, well, that's how it's going to be and live with it. No, we need to get it repaired. We need to get it fixed. We need to get it fixed. I've talked to people before that's had surgery that's lived for years and years and years and and didn't really think they had a, an opportunity to fix it, and they'll have some kind of surgery, and they'll say this, Preacher, I feel better than I felt in years. What happened? Got repaired. Got fixed. I'm, I'm convinced of this. I'm convinced that there's some miserable Christians who just need to repair their heart. I don't believe Christianity ought to be miserable. I, I really do. I, it, it worries me. When we come to church service time and time and time and time again, and everybody looks like they hate it, everybody looks like they're miserable, everybody looks like they leave the oxygen tank outside instead of bringing it on the inside, I, that worries me. There's something wrong with it. There's, there's a problem of the heart when that be the case. Now, what must be done if when we examine ourselves, and I would encourage us to do that. You ever looked at you? Anybody ever looked at pictures? Pictures are great. Pictures don't lie. Pictures don't lie. A picture can catch you at the absolute worst angle 
and freeze it there for eternity. You know what you do when you look in the mirror? You look a certain way in the mirror every time. And you fix that certain way every time. And it never fails. A picture will you get you from a side that you've never seen before. And because of your size, you don't have a prayer in seeing it without the picture. I mean, it just gets you this reality. But every now and again, you know, it might do us some good to take an examination of that picture and say, man, I got to do something. <laughs> I can't believe I let myself get that way. I got to do some, delete that picture from your phone. I'm going to post it, delete it. Say, so why? Because we take an examination and it shows us how we really are. You know, examine, examine how your conversation has been through the day. By the way, it's a scary thing. It's a scary thing. It's a very sobering thing. When you stop and you take, uh, uh, you take a little recollection back on the day and see some things you've said and the way you've said them, the way you've behaved, sometimes you probably hang your head and be a little ashamed of yourself. Snapped at people. We got, we got a little guy. He's a delivery driver. I'll give you this and I'll hurry through. Hey, yeah, anybody ever get aggravated when you're busy? You ever, anybody ever get a little flustered? You don't understand why people just can't do it right the first time? Like you always do. We got a little, little, a little guy, and I don't even know his name. He's just a young boy. But he's a delivery driver for one supply house we use. He calls me and asks me directions to the same job site every time he comes. I've been on that job for six months. Every time he comes, I'm coming up where, what, what street are you on? I was on the same one I was on last time. And he gets there, and I mean, it's just like he's in another world. I got employees that come to me and they say, Chris, I don't think he's right. And I say, I think you're right. He come up, he come the other day, and, he, and, and it's not his fault. They sent him in a truck, long story short, they sent him in a truck, didn't have a lift gate. I got a pallet there with all kinds of parts and pieces that we got to unload by hand, and it's 98 degrees and humid. I'm not happy. That's going to get my polo shirt sweaty. I didn't sign up for that. How many of you think that I probably offered to buy him lunch and thanked him for coming? I can tell you what I did. Man, I was huffing and puffing. I got my knife out and I was cutting the plastic off. And I said, here, just help me unload it. Let's get it in. I can't believe your supplier sent you this way. They ought to know better than that. I could have rolled it in, been done in five minutes. Now I've got to stack it all off twice. Thank you. Man, I got done and I'm like, man, I let him have it. So, preacher, you shouldn't have told that from the pulpit. Well, it's honest. I ain't proud of it, I just, but it's honest. But when I got done, I looked and I thought, here's it. This, this kid's just, he's just driving the truck. That's all he's doing. He's just driving the truck. He didn't ask him how to load it. He didn't order it. He didn't pull the order together. He helped me carry it in. You say, what'd you do? Man, I took some inventory and said, hmm, that probably came out of the wrong well. Probably came out of the wrong well. Now, you say, what are you saying? I'm saying there's times that we've got to do some repairing. There's times that we've got to do some fixing. Now, when I look at it, when I look at this repair that must be done, there's two or three phrases I want you to get. Take your Bible and go to Joel. Chapter number 2. Now, we're going to use our Bible a little bit tonight. Y'all pray for me. I'm using this new Bible. and It's, it's King James Bible, but it's a new Bible. I said that one time, and somebody asked me. I told them I used the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. And I was like, well, preacher, I thought you used the King James Bible. I said, it is a King James Bible. It's a study Bible. I thought, I'm about to get in big trouble. Joel, chapter number 2, and I want you to listen to this verse. Now, I know this is talking to Israel, okay? But the concept is there. In Joel, chapter number 2, in verse number 13, the Lord tells Israel, He said, and rend, what's that say? Your heart. You see, I can't rend Brother Darrell's heart. I can't rend Brother Chuck's heart. But I can rend mine. He said, rend your heart. Heart and not your garments. Now there's a couple things I want to talk to us about that real quick. The word rin means to tear or it's to tear in that of sorrow. It literally means to break your own heart. Break your own, allow the sorrow that's, that you call, allow your heart to be broken. Genuinely broken and genuinely rent if you would. There's a, there's a, 
an, an example of this will be found back in the book of Joshua. Do you remember when uh, Israel had first come into to the promised land? And man, they were winning victory after victory after victory. And they got to a place named Ai. Y'all remember Ai? And they got to Ai and they said, man, we're going to go out and conquer. And they said, you know what? They're just a little old country. We probably don't even need to take everybody up there. You know, I mean, you know, I know God's helped us, but you know, we, we can really handle this. We'll, we'll, we'll just not bother God with it. You say, what happened? Israel got whooped. Whooped. Bad. Come crying with their tail tucked between their legs, whimpering. Come back to camp. Lost. Lost people. And the Bible said that when that happened, Joshua rent his clothes and sat in sackcloth. And that's why he was sorrowful of what happened. That's what the word, he said, rend your heart. When I take an examination and I find out that my heart is not right, man, I need to be broken over that. And I need to ask God to help me over those things. There was a genuine brokenness because of their condition of straying. Man, Israel over and over and over again, straight and straight and straight and straight and straight. How many times do we as God's people do the same thing? We just get a little farther and a little farther and a little farther and a little farther. You know what he said? He said, rend your heart. Rend it, man. He said, you need to be broken over. But look, he said a genuine brokenness. There must be more than just outward contrition. Let me say this. We as independent, I'm an independent fundamental Baptist without apology. But we as independent Baptists have learned how to behave on the outside without changing anything on the inside. We've learned how to testify. We've learned how to cry. We've learned how to pray. We've learned how to teach. We've learned how to preach. But it's all outward. He said, rend your hearts. He said, I'm not worried about your clothes. I'm not worried about your garments. I'm not worried about you making a big show of everything and showing everybody how sorry you He said, no, I want you to rend your heart. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaking. That's what's coming out. He said, so rend your heart. So Job teaches, rend your heart. Deuteronomy teaches to circumcise your hearts. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse number 16, I'm going to, I'm going to move through this fairly quickly. But it literally means a cutting away. It's a cutting away of all things that would hinder us in obeying the things of God. What is, what is, what is clogged our heart, so to speak? You think about people that have heart issues, man. They, they've got, you know, those health, those health people, you know, the people that's always eating salads. Salad and grilled chicken, that's all they have. They, they don't get a big, sloppy, juicy cheeseburger. I mean, sopped in grease. I mean, the cheese just running off of it. Throw a little bit of that homemade chili on top of it. Mustard, I mean, just onions, pickles, hallelujah. Keep that nasty slaw, though, you can have it. And you look at it, you think, man, that is a cardio infarction waiting to happen. I mean, that is a cardiac arrest just waiting to transpire. And you say, what is it, man? All that grease clogs your arteries. By the way, if it'll clog your disposal, what you reckon it's going to do to you? Don't pour grease down your disposal. Don't worry, I ain't letting none of it go to waste. And it, and it clogs. There's something that clogs that heart. Something that clogs. He says, listen, cut away that stuff. Get that stuff out. Like it's hindering your walk. It's hindering your life. He said, but it's your heart. Nobody can do that for Israel. Israel had to do it for Israel. The Amorites weren't going to do it for them. The Amalekites weren't going to do it. The Philistines weren't going to do it for them. Israel had to do it. This world is not going to make sure you're clean and pure before God. You're going to have to do that. This world don't care. As a matter of fact, they're doing everything they can to defile you because it's ruining your testimony. You're going to have to do it for yourself. Job teaches, rend your heart. Deuteronomy teaches, circumcise your heart. Joshua teaches, I like this word, incline your hearts. Go to Joshua 24 quickly. Last chapter in the book of Joshua. You know where we get the, and for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Joshua chapter number 24. Listen with me if you would as I read verse number 23. He says, Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, look at this, and incline your heart. And incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. The word inclining means, literally means this. It is a turning toward. 
it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's really the idea of forsaking this life and turning toward this. You know, when we get things in our life, there's some, there, before we can just turn to God and say everything's wonderful, there might be for, some forsaking of some things that must take place. What happened here in the book of, in the book of Joshua? Man, Israel had been plagued. They, they did exactly what God told them not to. Don't make alliances with people in the land. Don't marry. Don't all this. Their, their false gods will come in into your society. It'll mess up your kids. It'll mess up your children. By the way, parents, it still works the same. If you're married to the world, it's going to hurt your children. It's going to hurt your grandchildren. You better be very cautious of what you allow to come in. But they did just that. And it drew their hearts away from God. And he said, so therefore, Israel, we're going to march forward. We're going to go forward. God's done all these things. He said, listen, we are going to incline our heart to turn our hearts back to God. He said, preacher, if I take an examination and I see some, some things are not right in my life, what do I need to do? You better turn your heart back to God. You better turn your heart back there. You better stop living for you and get back to, to, to doing what he said. Psalm 51, David prays in his guilt. You see, David had committed sin with, uh, sin with Bathsheba. And in Psalm 51, you read of David's prayer. And we've read that. It's a familiar passage of Scripture. It's a, a lot of preaching in, in Psalm 51. But David prays on his guilt from responding to the flesh and sinning against God. His prayer, he asks God this, this, this request. He says, God created me a clean heart. You say, what had happened? David had defiled his heart. My friend, if sin will defile David, the man after God's own heart, sin will defile you and I and our hearts. David said, God created me a clean heart. Wash me. Wash me. Renew in me a right spirit. Or renew a right spirit within me. Cleanse me. Create in me. Purify me. You see, it might be tonight that we as God's people, the reason that we're responding in such a way that we are, maybe the fact is we just need a heart that's in need of repair. Maybe we've got a heart. Maybe, we, maybe we've bought into the, to the way of this world. And, and by the way, if you're around people that's angry enough, before long you're going to get angry about something. And this world hates everything. They hate everybody. They're trying to, they're trying to, stir, they're trying to stir up strife and discord. And, and they've got the church all out of kilter. Maybe it's time that we do a little bit of self-evaluation and we need to understand, God, I just got some fixing and I need done. I got some fixing. Second thing I want us to see tonight. We'll hit this one quickly, the, term, the, the determination of the heart. Go to 1 Chronicles 22. The determination. One can really view this as the focus, if you would, of the heart. Before I read, let me ask you this question. What is it that our heart is really focused on? Now, that, that answer is going to be different for everybody, by the way. What is it that my heart is focused on? What is it that your heart's focused on? Let me give you this. There's a lot of people that, you know what they're focused on? They're focused on making a dollar. That's their whole focus. And they'll sacrifice everything to make that dollar. Now listen, I'm not against making money. I'm not against you, I'm not against you making a lot of it. But what I am against is people that make money and sacrifice the relationship with God in order to make it. Listen, if you walk with God, love Jesus, serve God, whatever, I hope you make a parcel of it. So, preacher, does it bother you if I drive a nicer car than you do? Look up here. No, just take me for a ride every now and again. Everybody's happy. Does it bother you if somebody makes more money? No, it doesn't. I mean, preacher, would you like to make more money? Don't ask me a question like that. Wouldn't you? I know you spiritual people wouldn't know, preacher. I've learned whatsoever state I am, they're with to be content. I didn't say I wasn't content. I got a good life. God's blessed me. God's been good to me. But come on, I'm just as human as you are. But some people, that's all their focus is. Yeah, yeah, you, you appreciate things the older you get, don't you? You don't really appreciate your time with your kids when you have time with your kids. You know when you really begin to appreciate your time with your kids when they're about to leave? I'm telling you. I'm telling you firsthand. You know why? Because you're trying to pay bills. You're trying to make sure that you got groceries in the cabinet. You're trying to make sure you got food on the table. You're trying to make sure if they need to go to the doctor, there's enough money to buy to go to the doctor. You're trying to make sure you got a house to live in, a car to drive, uh, you know, shoes on their feet, clothes on their back. I mean, you're busy. But it's amazing the things that you put way up here on your priority list in. When them young ones get ready to say goodbye, those things become way down on your priority list. You wouldn't care. Listen, if you had to go to Chuck E. Cheese again, if you could just go one more time. I, I understand I'm preaching because I don't like Chuck E. Cheese. But don't miss something. 
we got to figure out where our focus is. What are we living for? Man, to make that money. Or, or preacher, I'm, I'll tell you what I'm living for. I'm living to just to be happy. You'll never, ever do it if that's all you're living for. If your happiness is found in things, you'll never have enough things. You know new wears off of stuff? New ever wore off anything? Anybody ever got that new toy, that new car? My wife's fussing at me. I got a lot of, I got a lot of stuff I want. I like toys. Toys are good. I like toys. I like shiny ones. I like loud ones. I like fast ones. I do. I like toys. Toys are good. But you know what I found out about toys, Brother Chuck? When I get one, I find another one I like to have. Man, scrolling Facebook Marketplace is my, one of my favorite pastimes. I, I'd shut Facebook down if I could keep Marketplace. If I didn't have to look at all that political ad and just see what people had for sale, I'd, I'd be all about it. Craigslist, I like it. Do you know what I find out? I find something, it ain't, it ain't two swipes later, and I found something else I'd like to have. Or something that was something on this swipe would go with something on that first swipe. See, what are you saying? Some people, that's all they live for. That's all they live for. The problem is, is that that's all you live for. Your focus is going to be on a kilter. And you're going to give your heart to those things. You give your heart to those things. Now let me show you this. First Chronicles chapter number 22. Verse number 19, the Bible says this. Now set your heart. Now did you hear that? Set your heart. So he said, rend your heart, the book of Joel. He said, circumcise your heart, the book of Deuteronomy. He said, incline your heart in the book of Joshua. But now he tells us to set your heart. And, and if you look at this and you look at what's going on, you understand that David is, is giving some instructions to Solomon that's getting ready to go, getting ready to become the king. He's, he's addressing his son. I want you to think, for, think about old Solomon for just a minute. Solomon is known as the wisest king ever. Solomon is also known as one of the richest kings ever. Solomon is attributed to building the temple. Solomon is also known for gathering up stuff that kings was never supposed to have. Wealth, women, and horses, and he had them all. Solomon lived to please Solomon. But yet he wrote, vanity is vanity, all is vanity. Why do you reckon that is? Maybe he had a change of heart. But David, in writing to Solomon, he said, Solomon, he said, I want you to set your heart. Uh, listen, when you look at the word set, it literally means, Solomon, I want you to determine. I want you to focus, if you will. Set your heart on God. It's to direct. It's to direct. So when he says, set your heart and your soul, to do what, Sol to, to do what, Dad? To seek the Lord your God. First and foremost, he said, Solomon, listen, you need, you need more. Than, and I believe he did he somewhat to this counsel because when God asked him what he wanted, he said, God, I need wisdom. I need your wisdom. But somewhere along the line, Solomon began to do what we can so easily do. But he said, I want you to set your heart to seek the Lord your God. His dedication. Listen, maybe we need to just to refocus on our dedication for a minute. Maybe we just need to take an inward look and say, hey, why is all this, why is all this stuff spewing forth in my life? Why is, maybe it's the fact that I've gotten things out of focus. Maybe it's the fact that I need to get back to being determined by the grace of God that I'm going to set my heart to seek God regardless of what this world does, regardless of what the church building does, regardless of what any preacher, a politician, or anybody else said. I personally am going to set my heart. I know people that's gotten so discouraged because a preacher has fallen. And by the way, I'm not for it either. I think it brings a blemish upon the cause of Christ. But look up here. Listen, you're not following a preacher. God didn't call you to, to follow with your whole life a preacher. I gave you a pastor to be an under-shepherd, to be a leader. But your confidence is not to be in a pastor. Your confidence is being the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, I don't mean this wrong. Pastors come, pastors go. You're called, you better be following somebody greater than a, than a fallible man. Listen, I'm, I'm for pastoral authority. I'm for a pastoral leadership. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I think you know me better than that. But people that get out because of the direction or the actions of a pastor... If you got to go somewhere, go, but don't quit following God. Set your heart. 
me give you one other thing. There's also some knots of the heart. Some knots. Like do not do. That kind of knot. Not tying them in a knot, but knots. The heart of the believer is not only to be led by the do's, but we're also shaped by some of the do nots. Preacher, that sounds awful much like rules. I know, everybody hates rules, don't they? Nobody likes rules. That's why we're trying to have anarchy in our country. Nobody likes rules until the rules benefit them. Then they like rules. You ought to be able to burn down everything until they burn down your house and steal your cars and attack your children. Then we want to call the police. That's free. That didn't cost y'all nothing. But there are some things that we are to do in life. But there's also some things that we're not to do. We must participate with our heart, but we also must protect our heart. We must protect some things to do. We've got to participate, but we've also got to protect some things in our heart. Now, first of all, in Psalm 95, 8, there's two things, and I'm just about done. You've listened well, and I appreciate that, but two things. Number one, Psalm 95, 8, he says, harden not your heart. Remember he tells him, harden not your heart as in the day of provocation. He says, hard and not your You know what the problem, one of the problems we're having in churches today is we are living with hard-hearted people. It is hard to be sensitive to anything when you're so calloused in everything. He says, harden not your heart. It gives the indication as if I have a choice in the matter, which you do. You know why? Because it's your heart. It's your heart. We have, we, have, we have manly men in the, in the services. I think that's a good thing. I think a man ought to be manly. I do. I think they ought to be manly. But Fellas, it is your choice. Uh, this is not in my notes. But whether or not you're going to use hand lotion so you can have soft hands. It's your choice. Now, let me say this. If you work in the right kind of material, it will bust your fingers to pieces and you will be glad to get some relief so your hands will quit cracking and busting. <laughs> now that being said, whether or not your hands become calloused and rough and busting and cracking or whether or not you allow to have soft hands, I'm not for or against you, I'm just putting it out there. Is all going to depend on you. Now, as goofy as that sounds, and, and we're laughing at the men at their own expense, I understand that. But you understand there's a choice as to what I'm going to allow to happen to my body. I'm either not going to take care of it, or I'm going to take care of it. Well, listen, don't allow that heart to get so calloused and hardened. That you're not sensitive to things in the Spirit of God. So he says, harden not your heart is in the, the day of provocation. The word harden, it, it literally means stubbornness. We would call them hard-headed. Anybody in here hard-headed? Anybody hard-headed? Don't raise your hand. Anybody have a hard-headed spouse? Well, she raised it. I knew she would. <clears throat> Can't see nothing but a little old bitty head back there and she's raising her hand. We understand what it means to be hard-headed. Let me break it down for you. That means we can't tell you nothing. That's what it means. You ever talk to somebody and say, you can't tell them nothing? I just will talk to that post right there. You know what you're saying? They are hard-headed. But the sad thing about it is there's some believers that have become hard-hearted. And when the Spirit of God who speaks and works in that still small voice through the pages of Scripture... When he begins to work in their heart, they never respond. Why? Because they become calloused. He said, harden not your heart. When we pop off at the mouth or when we're short or when we're this, it's not because the Spirit of God has led us in that. Now, I'm not trying to make light of, of the leadership of the Spirit of God because let me tell you what happens. As soon as I open my mouth, the Spirit of God lets me know you shouldn't have said that. You shouldn't have said it that way. Or it wasn't that little boy's fault that you're aggravated. You say, what are you saying? I'm telling you, harden not your heart. It's a scary thing when you can go and do and do and do and do and all of a sudden, you don't hear that anymore. 
you don't you don't feel that conviction anymore. You don't you don't seem to be respond to that chastening anymore. It's not because God's quit dealing; it's because you've hardened your heart. He said, "Harden not your heart." Webster's uses this. He said, "It's firm and unusually unreasonable adherence to an opinion. It's a fixedness that I will not obey to any persuasion or argument by no other means." I, I know people that will not lose an argument even when they know they're wrong. They'll argue to their blue in the face because they'd rather be wrong and win, a, win, a, win an argument than they would to be right and lose one. There's people that argue with God the same way. He said, harden not your heart. But then he says this. I like this and I'm done. This is, we're going to end on a high note. Can anybody tell me what John 14, verse number 1 says? Let me start it for you. He says, let not your be troubled. Ain't that good? He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house for many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Man, in the day and hour that we live, People that don't know what's going to happen tomorrow and they're, they're grabbing at straws trying to figure out everything. Listen to me. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but we don't have to be troubled about it. I know where I'm going. I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Let not your heart be troubled. we got to be careful that we don't allow our hearts to become troubled. When our hearts become troubled, it affects our demeanor. It, are, it affects our responses. I don't know if anybody's ever been, been tired of being miserable. Uh, if you've ever battled bitterness, let me put it this way. If you've ever battled, battled bitterness, bitterness will beat you down. Bitterness will wear you out. And it'll come to a place in time that you'll get so sick of being miserable and bitter that when you come to God, it's almost like a weight comes off your shoulders. He says, let not your heart be troubled. There, there, I, I got to hurry. Verse 27 in John 14, there's peace in that. You'll find peace and just allowing God, let not your heart be troubled. There's peace in making that choice. Hey, the pouring out, Psalm 62, verse number 8, the Bible tells us to pour out our heart unto God. Do you realize, child of God, that no matter how bad things get, we've got an outlet. We can take it to the Father in heaven. And it literally, you say, preacher, what does pouring out mean? It literally means just to pour it forth and just lay everything that you've got out on the table and say, God, here's what's on my heart. God, I'm mad. God, I'm glad. I'm upset. I'm happy. I feel like shouting. I feel like crying. God, every, here it is, God. This is in my heart. He says, pour out your heart. There's a peace. There's a pouring out. That means I can give God my worries. I can give God my anxieties. I can give God my fear. I can give God my anger. Hey, listen, I can rejoice with God over my joy. I can praise God over Him and His goodness. Whatever it is, He said, just pour your, your, your heart out into God. God, I don't understand. I'm confused. Pour it out. Tell God. There's a peace. There's a pouring out. There's a promise or a preservation of the Lord. Go to Psalm 31. Psalm 31, look down at verse number 23. He said, oh, oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints. That's a pretty good place to start. For the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. He says, be of good courage and he shall, what's that say? Strengthen your heart. All ye that hope in the Lord. He shall strengthen your heart. Now, that's a promise. Now, that's not me strengthening my That's me allowing God to strengthen my heart. The preacher, when I'm weak, oh, yes. But we learn about when his strength is made perfect in our weakness. We learn about that. His grace is sufficient to meet our He said he will strengthen us. When we feel like that we can't go forward, we feel like we can't go on, we feel like all hope is lost, we pour our heart out to God, we allow God to strengthen. Who does He strengthen? He strengthens the, the saints that are faithful. That's what Psalm says, the saints that are faithful. It's God who provides the strength to His faithful saints. Now, <clears throat> Jeremiah 17, 10, we learn of God, I, the Lord, search the heart. We looked at verse number 9, but in verse number 10, remember, the heart is deceitful and desperate of all things, and or, the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? 
Well, verse number 10 answers that. He said, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. And we would acknowledge that God certainly does know our heart. By the way, you don't have the wool pulled over God's eyes. You may come into church like everything's hunky-dory and everything's wonderful and your heart might be perverted, your heart might be filled up with dirt and bitterness and anger and malice and all these things. You might be broken, you might be fearful, you might be full of anxiety. You can, you can fool everybody else, but God knows your heart. God, listen, God knows your heart whether you're saved or lost. God knows whether you're right or not right. God knows whether you're walking with Him or you're not walking with Him. God knows your heart. And we wouldn't argue with that, would we? But what about this? See, preacher, you showed us the Bible teaches we should repair our hearts. And when we do something wrong, we should be determined in our hearts. We ought to focus on the Lord. And you said there's some things, there's some things we can't do. But, but preacher, how do I really know? God knows, but how do I know my heart? Hebrews 4.12. What does the Bible say in Hebrews 4.12? Let's think about it. You ready? For the word of God is quick and powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and the marrow, and is a what? A discerner, a discerner of what? Of the thoughts and intents of the heart. How can I recognize the condition of my heart? He says, for the word of God is quick. When I can take my life, and I can look at my responses, I can look at my actions, I can look at my attitude, I can look at my speech, I can look at my demeanor, I can look at my goals, I can look at what I'm focused on, I can look at what I'm living for. When I can look at those things and I can compare them in the light of the Word of God, let me tell you this, it will reveal to me my heart. It'll do it. It'll reveal to me my condition and the condition of my heart. People with heart issues, they know maybe a little something's wrong, but when they go to the doctor and maybe they put those little monitors on them and they'll keep up with their heart rhythm and all that, and they say, well, you have an arrhythmia or you have you know, a heart murmur or you have this or, or whatever it might be. You know how they do that? Because they compare that with data. Let me tell you something. If you'll start taking your life and your feelings and your reactions and all those and you'll compare them with some data, you can know the condition of your heart. And if you know the condition of your heart, you can do something about the condition of your heart. If you're here tonight, listen, maybe there's some things that you know there. Maybe nobody else, maybe your spouse don't even know they're there. So preacher, but I know my heart's not right. Listen, rend that heart. And rend it. Maybe if you're here tonight and say, preacher, uh, I'm just not, my focus is not, I'm not determined in some things. I'm living for the wrong thing. Listen, be determined. You're going to prepare your heart to seek God. You're going to seek God. You're going to do that to seek the Lord. Oh, listen, maybe, that, maybe tonight there's some things that you need to protect your heart from. Maybe you need to protect it from becoming hardened. Maybe you need to protect it from the anxiety and just to understand, listen, I can't let my heart be troubled. God's too good. The promises of God is too real. The coming of Jesus is too soon. I can't allow my heart to get troubled. Whatever you need might be tonight. It can all be summed up in this. It's a matter of the heart. But it's your heart. Would you stand with me tonight? The way we live as believers is certainly a matter of the heart. Mr.